Look around. Everywhere these days, people are crying out for effective leadership. There's no mistaking it any longer. Men, especially leaders, are struggling, emasculated by imposed rules, stereotyping, and leadership models that are no longer working. There are many women who are doing a much better job at leadership than the men, and we need to recognize them. We need their help too. Welcome to Well, the Women's Expressions on Leadership, Learning, and Liberty podcast show, and I'm its host, John Krotek. This is the show where women can help us men to be better men, more effective leaders. Super excited about this episode of Well Podcast. Um, I met this person three and a half years ago in Dallas, Texas at a veterans event. We hit it off right away. She walks proud. She walks tall. She's a no-nonsense person, and I really like working with her. Her name, well, she's a United States Army decorated combat officer. Her name is Kaylin Areola. She, um, she's actually, she worked as a public affairs officer in Iraqi Freedom 5 and was awarded the Bronze Star Medal, which is not an easy one to get, and the Keith L. Ware Journalism Award for her work in military journalism. So, you know, kudos to her. That's pretty good stuff there. She's also the founder and owner of KMC Digital. KMC Digital is a marketing agency dedicated to helping people and their businesses to fulfill their dreams and their calling in life. And I've been working closely with Kaylin for a few years now, uh, actually real hardcore for a year. And I got to say, it's been, a, it's been an incredible journey. I've been schooled cr- quite a bit. And, uh, you know, we can still be open to, uh, uh, to learning, even at this stage of the game. I thought I knew everything, and, and Kaylin reminded me that I don't know much. But anyhow, welcome to the show, Kaylin. Really humbled and honored to have you here on our pilot season of Well. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. I'm excited for this whole podcast series. I know you've already done a bunch of really great interviews, so I look forward to it. Well, we've had our fun, and maybe this is the episode to talk about it. The episode started out womp, and then Kaylin, very quickly in the way that she does things, didn't think womp was such a good name. We won't <laughs> take it there, but womp turned into well. Womp started out as Women on uh, Men podcast. Didn't sound good. Kaylin said we, we probably don't need to go there, and then we turned it into what the poetic human is, the base, women's expressions on leadership, learning, and liberty. So thank you for that. You know, who? how could I not have you on the pilot episodes or series of, of this podcast, Kaylin? Because your, your leadership attributes speak for themselves. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> so here we go. Let's get started. Tell us a little bit, Kaylin, about your upbringing and, and how you develop these leadership skill sets that, are, that, are, that you're now using to help people like myself and businesses to do the things they need to do to be successful. Tell us about your household. Um, I'd say growing up, uh, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, North Providence to be exact, just a little north of the main downtown area. And um, my parents were 19 years old when I was born. So we didn't have a lot of money. We lived in kind of a three-story, you know, those typical New England three-story houses you see on TV. Um, and it was a little apartment. My parents had a, well, I think, well, my father was working at a mill. He was doing all kinds of odd jobs um, because surprise, he's had a kid and probably wasn't in the plans. Not that <laughs> early anyway. <laughs> so um, they had great support from my grandparents um, and they were making it on their own, but bills, you know, things are expensive. And I know my parents, my father worked at mill jobs. He worked fixing machinery for a while. My mom was pretty much stay-at-home mom, but her mom started cleaning houses and then invited her to go help out, said, hey, I got all these houses I'm cleaning. Can you help me? Because there's not enough. I, I don't have enough people to help do all this work, but there's a lot of money we can make if we keep doing these houses. So my mom started doing that part-time. And then my dad was like, you're making more than me now doing these houses. You know, what if we did this full time and we didn't just do houses, we did buildings. So they started to 
I remember when they got their first set of business cards and it had their fancy brand on it, executive maintenance. I, and I remember our phone number too, because at one point, I think I was 12 or 13 or maybe even younger than that. And I was calling people back that had called to make an appointment with them. And they're like, here's phone numbers. This is their, you know, so early on, I watched them start from zero and then grow it, you know, until it was paying for everything and they bought a house and I just saw how entrepreneurship could help people and it does not matter your age, it doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter if you started out with nothing, um, you can build something from nothing with businesses. And so early on I thought that was cool because my parents were home during the day when other parents weren't and we were able to go, you know, skip school every once in a while and go to the beach or go do something fun and it was kind of gave you that freedom and that flexibility to to make your own schedule. And I always wanted that for myself someday. Um, but my life took a turn and I ended up in the military. Um, I did stay reserved the whole time. So I was able to work a civilian job and a military job. But even when I was in Iraq, I was putting business plans together. Like I've always wanted to own a campground. I always thought it would be fun to have a campground slash farm combo where the community could come in and they could I have a farmer's market there, you know, fresh food, fresh stuff. And now that's, I guess, really trendy. But um, when I was putting the business plan together, yeah, I didn't, it was not as trendy at that time. But, and I have yet to do it, but I will someday. Um, but when I came back, all my training, basically going into public affairs in the army, going into media and PAO type jobs in the civilian side, kind of led me naturally to helping people with their businesses when I was pregnant with my daughter. And I knew I wanted to have that life that my parents created for us when we were little, where I could be home with her. Well, you just, you know, you just, and all that, you just laid that out. So here, what I'm getting is you were schooled early on in work ethic, yep. the concept of startups, uh, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. flexibility, idea generation, and calling your own shots, you know, a little bit of independence here. So all of those things you adapted to early on and, and you've carried them with you up until this point in time. I mean, the, you just told me the whole life story. Well, not really the whole life story, but a lot of where you got your foundation right off the bat. And so I kind of get the feeling, Kaylin, that you're, you're almost like a sponge. So <laughs> leadership, and I mean that in a good way. So you know, good leaders are like sponges, you know, they learn and they adapt and they see the things around them. And, and then they, and then they make these things or they take these things and they uh, execute them, mm -hmm. put them in the, put them in the practice. That's pretty interesting. So uh, a, a female officer in a man's army world, you know, what was that like? Honestly, I, I find the whole thing really funny because I actually just was texting with one of my bosses from the army last night. It was super late after hours, but he was always a workaholic and so was I. And it was funny because I was not surprised to get a message from him. Um, but in the army, I think having that foundational uh, business owner kind of startup actually helped me a lot in the army. People asked me when I was an officer if I had been an NCO before. And I wasn't, but my family was su super blue collar family. So I guess, I don't know, maybe that is why. Um, I just always felt like if there was a job that had to get done, just volunteer and go do it. I know the joke in the military is don't volunteer for anything because you don't know what it's going to be. But I always did the opposite of that. And, um, you know, I was not a good leader in the army at all. Uh, at least I didn't think so. And I definitely made my leadership angry with me. It was different working for females than males sometimes. I felt like I, the guys that I worked for, I was very blessed. For the most part, I'd say 90% gave me a chance because of my skill set. And they also were surprised when I was on working with active duty that a reservist would have that skill set. So when I went, it, it's just, um, gosh, there's so much to say about that. I had very toxic leaders that were men as well. Um, I had a guy who <laughs> grabbed the collar of my jacket and dragged me into an alley. It was, we were, I would say alley, but it was like a dark, it was funny. My soldiers were there. Um, I was trying to explain to him that, you know, I had already made these flight arrangements. So don't worry about a thing. Everything's already booked. So we come in there and he starts berating this E4 and he was an O3. 
starts telling this kid, like, you better get my sleeping arrangements right now, soldier, like talking very strangely, like really upset with this kid. It was three o'clock in the morning. We'd been flying for four hours because uh, I don't know if you ever were on a Sherpa. The National Guard had these Sherpa planes, but they don't have any air conditioning. So like everyone's kind of in a bad mood. Four hours, three in the morning, we're all tired and hungry. And I was trying to tell him, hey, don't worry, because they've got our information. All we have to do is tell him, you know, that we're here. He starts ripping this kid a new one. And I was probably out of line, but I was like, sir, I'm like, he they already has my, our information, right? So he took that as me basically insubordinate, like telling him like to not yell at this kid. But I didn't think it was called for. You know, I just thought the kid was half asleep. He was on night duty. <laughs> he kid starts freaking out, sees his rank, starts you know, jumping up, and we're reserved, and these kids are active duty, right? Too, which is doesn't matter, but at the end of the day, like. I'm sure his officers on active duty weren't talking to him in that manner all the time. Like he was on regular overnight duty. So all these things are going through my mind and my boss is like, Oh, okay. And he kind of calms down, but I didn't realize he was super mad. Like I had usurped his authority or I don't know, two seconds later, we're about to go in the thing. I feel the back of my shirt get pulled on. He physically pulls me, drags me like 10 feet away into where it was dark. Cause there was a light. I will never forget this. Cause it took me by surprise. And he's like, he got in my face like an inch, like he was spitting on me. I will never forget it for the rest of my life. He goes, you little B word. He's like, you are an F and B and nobody can stand you. No one in this unit can stand you. He goes, and you have no effing right to call me out in front of an effing soldier like that. Don't you ever effing forget who your leader is. Like in my face, I will never forget it. And I didn't even say anything. I just stood there. I didn't move back. I just stood right there and I just... He screamed right at me. My soldiers heard the whole thing. And one of them, like the male, there was a male and a female soldier right by where I was. And they were like, like, I remember Laza, he goes, holy S-H-I-T, like, are you okay? Like afterwards. And then what that leader did is he called my boss, his boss too, our commander. And he told her a whole different story of events. And he got to her first. She did not believe my version of the story at all. Um, and I was completely blackballed like after that. Like basically they sent me to a more dangerous area with a couple of my other guys. Um, and uh, you know, I, I did later on talk to him and years later when he was working at the Pentagon cause uh, he stayed in and he just kept getting promoted. Um, <laughs> but I, I'll did never you guys ever did you ever square it away? I mean, there's a perfect example of power over others being exercised in, in a rude, nasty manner. I mean, it, two wrongs, maybe I, I don't know, don't make a right, or you know what I'm saying? It, it's there was a way take, he could have talked to me and he could have said, take, Hey, yeah, if he said, Hey, Kaylin, he's like, I get that you organized all this, but you don't have to interrupt me when I'm talking to somebody. He could have said it that way, like, I am all for learning and correction. Um, but it wasn't even that it was like his ego was bruised and I really didn't, hmm. I was being very like, I didn't yell when I interrupted him. So it, it was just like a shocker to me. Like I was completely shocked, but what it revealed was his actual feelings toward me, probably that he was holding on to for quite a long time. And so when they said, Hey, do you want to go downrange to some other place? it's a little more dangerous than where you are now because I was at the headquarters with third ID, which was in um, Baghdad, but it was pretty secure. And they said, you know, there's a fob down there. Your other two guys from your unit are down there and they could use some help. Um, so I went down there and spent the rest of my deployment with them and I loved it. And actually my boss who was, um, now he's a three-star general, but at the time when I worked for him, he was a full bird colonel. And he pretty much let me, he's the one that gave me the bronze star. And I had someone pull me aside and say, you know, I know the bronze star is not for Valor's leadership, but he's like, you, you know, people of your rank never get that, especially not from him. He doesn't believe in giving anyone those. And I normally don't even talk about it because I didn't really do anything. I didn't really do anything to, to, that I thought was significant enough to even have him give me that. But I was humbled because he was a very strict leader he chewed me out in front of people multiple times, but always came back to talk to me after and say, listen, you took that butt chewing like a champion. Like I, he goes, I am shocked you didn't cry actually. He's like, and I, um, 
I said, sir, honestly, I said, there was just a misunderstanding. I said, and I knew that information hadn't gotten relayed over to you properly. And so I didn't, it's okay. Like, and he goes, no, he goes, I, I really laid into you like more so than I even lay into the guys. And uh, he goes, I, he, he apologized and, and we reconnected later. So it's, it's, I love, I, in a way I do love talking about leadership because I feel like it, it, he was more worried about the safety of his soldiers when he yelled at me. So to me, it was legitimate versus you pissed me off. My ego's bruised. I'm going to rip you a new one. It was a different, it was a it, correction of, of, it was different. You know well, when I mean? the smoke clears, it's always, you know, what you just pointed out, ego and leadership can equal trouble, but can also equal a learning opportunity. And yeah. And leadership is fascinating. You know, we're involved in the leadership project now, but you know, it, it is a couple of things just based on, you know, you just point, leadership is badly needed and leadership is so important to the interaction, not only in the military environment, but also in business and even at home, you know, it's, it's something that leaders, in fact, I believe that we all have the potential to be leaders, mothers at home, mothers at business, mothers in the community and the same thing with the guys. Um, funny you talk about volunteering I never volunteered when I was in the service but you know what I always got picked so I started to think you know why am I always getting picked to do the jobs that nobody wants to volunteer for and I remember a captain told me once you know off the cuff NCO to the officer said because they want it done right and I thought that was a nice compliment even though they never told me that and I hated doing some of the things they always picked me to do but we always got the job done. And, and so that was humbling too. But anyhow, it's not about me. It's about leadership and, and the things that we learn. So I have, you know, one of the reasons I even wanted to do this show is I have great admiration for, for female leaders because I think that many times uh, they don't get the legitimate respect that they deserve. And because it can be deemed a man's world. And, and, and honestly, I'm a little bit tired of that. I think that women are, are equally capable. It's never, can a woman open a door? Of course she can. Should a man open the door? If it's given that opportunity, he should show some respect. So there's, there's ways that both genders, and that's a hot topic, can, can, can take the high ground here. Yeah. Uh, and, and you learn from the best. And let me tell you something. I wasn't joking, Kalen. They don't hand out bronze stars. I, I, you know, I know you're not bragging on it, but you should, and I know you are, but that's something to be proud of. That's that bronze star medal might be a piece of cloth with a metal star on it, but the, the what it signifies is dedication and excellence in, in what you did. Military journalism, you know, getting the stories out there in terrible conditions in a combat environment yeah, give give her what she deserves and, and congratulations for that. Well, thanks. I felt like I was with a bunch of infantry and what was I doing? I was typing. So I, <laughs> I appreciate that. In a combat environment, yeah. The reason that I look on it as a positive thing is because of the person that gave it to me because I respected him as a leader. And I think the reason I respected him so much is because he would talk to everybody, whether it was a E1 to an 06 he didn't care about rank in that way he wanted to know like when the sexual assault situations were coming up he pulled me I wasn't even active duty with them he asked me do you want to go on active duty we'll get you the paperwork like right now which I wish I did actually but <laughs> that's a whole nother story but he you know he's like you can be active duty we'll bring you back with us you can stay on our deployment cycle the reserves will like let you go we just have to detach you like he had the whole thing planned out and um he grabbed me and a couple of females that he trusted from his unit. He's like, you're a really level-headed female. He's like, I can, can I just be honest? And he laid it all out about here's the sexual assaults going on. Here's the 90% of them are related to this. And, um, and, and I was shocked that actually more of them were men on men than women on women, the numbers that we had. And so um, mm. we had to have a town hall meeting. We talked about his leadership was so like, I will never forget working for him. Um, there's been two or three guys that I worked for that I were really awesome and good mentors for me, but um, he just would take, he didn't care your rank, he cared about who you were as a person, because there were NCOs and officers that he talked to about the situation, and he said, all right, let's do a town hall meeting and talk about all this, and then 
what's the plan? What do we want to do to help, you know, mitigate these situations? And it was a, not an easy thing to be with a bunch of infantry for that conversation because, you know, most of them are men. And then the small amount of females that were there were more like support staff, like HR type people and the military HR, which we call in the army, the S1 shop, which is personnel, admin, you know, pay, pay stuff. There were a lot of females in there. And the supply side, there was a lot of females that were in supply and, but not still not that many. Um, so I, I felt like that's the kind of leader that I wanted to emulate because I wasn't that when I was in the army, I was terrible. When I was with my reserve unit, I learned so much just working for that guy because it changed me after that. When I worked for on the reserve side, I was gossiping. I was venting. I was barfing all my stress onto my soldiers. They would be, you know, they, we would just go out and I was a smoker at the time. Thankfully I quit. But when I was in Iraq, we'd go out to have cigarettes, talk about just, just like, I didn't think about it because I grew up in a house where we talked about everything, good, bad, ugly, and we hashed it all out and then we moved on. But it was looked at as like really gossiping and berating like, or just talking crap about people, which in my mind, I was just processing it. But then I could see now that I look back, it was really toxic. So well, I was, you know, but at least you understood that, you know, and the leadership in the military is one thing. And, but you were obviously influenced by your household. Let's back up before you went in the service. What did you learn about men? What were you, what, what did you learn about boys early on? And, and, mm -hmm. and how did you approach, you know, with that, we don't have to go real deep, but you know, what was the perception of guys coming along? What was that? Um, I don't know. I, my father was really strict kind of, um, I had always a lot of guy friends and girlfriends, but for the most part, I hung with the girls. We had like six or seven of us in middle school that always did stuff together. And then in high school, I had five or six girlfriends there. We, I switched school districts um, quite a few times, but uh, when I did end up in the high school that I went to, it was like that. I've, I've always been good with like small groups of women friends that I can trust and talk to. And that I'm better off like that. But um Men, I don't think I even gave it much of a thought. I think my dad, I always saw my dad as an individual person. I didn't really look at him and go, oh, all men must be like that. It wasn't really talked about at all in the house. You know, I mean, I, my dad was very strict um, in certain mm -hmm. ways. He wasn't very loving as a dad. He would hug us once in a while, but because he thought that was a good thing to do. But his father wasn't very loving. His father, I mean, my grandfather on holidays would be there to eat the food. And the second it was time to open presents and be a family and talk and laugh, he would open his gift and he would go upstairs and go to bed for the night. And it would be like nine o'clock, eight o'clock at night. And he'd be done that every holiday. And if it was a birthday party, he'd be like, okay, happy birthday, blah, 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 gone. My grandparents eventually had to take separate cars because my grandmother loved family and she wanted to hug all the grandkids and play with them. And my grandfather, not. And it came from, you know, alcoholism. His father was an alcoholic, super brutal when he was drinking, just tearing him up. And then he tore his kids up. And then my dad kind of tried to stop that momentum. But there's things that kind of stick with you, you know, through your childhood. So you accidentally tear up your kids. <laughs> so he kind of, you know, so for me getting my butt chewed in the army was nothing as bad as what my father could have done. He was, he could pick one thing that he knew hurt your feelings and he could rip it up. And, uh, and he knows he can do that. And now he's so much more mellow and I have a great relationship with him. But um, as a kid, it really shaped my self-esteem. Like I had zero. And that's also probably why I was not a great uh, leadership because I was so critical of myself that I was equal I was equally critical of other people because I just that was my mode that was I was just a critical person in general well you know, yeah you know with well, that's brutal honesty you know so that's a leadership trait too that you know when I this conversation you know leaders that can be brutally honest and understand um the deal make better leaders so you may not have been that then but you're certainly on that now and you know, and, and those we've talked about trauma, it's an it's an ancestral thing and it goes on and on and on until the buck stops. And and then, 
that's when things really start to change. And, and so you're on a good trajectory now. You know, when we were when at the outset of the show, we talked about um, where we met in Dallas. And, 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 you know, looking at everybody and looking at that back then, three and a half, four years ago, you did stand out. You weren't the typical – you, you seem like a, you seem like somebody that was a free thinker and somebody that was open and somebody that that was a no nonsense person and somebody from the outside who didn't know you from Adam. I picked up on it right away and I said that this person is, is, a, is somebody you can trust because she's a straight shooter. And I think that comes from what you just said, Caitlin, you know, the brutal honesty and the self reflection that certainly showed emanating from you in Dallas well that's good feedback I mean I think I do I used to overanalyze everything I'm better now because I don't really now I'm like you know what if if I upset somebody they'll just know not to ask me again <laughs> they won't come to me for an opinion anymore because I just can't when you sugarcoat things too, the people around you who are asking for that feedback they don't get good feedback you know and it may just be my opinion or the way I see it. And I always tell people, well, this is just the way I see it, but you should ask other people their perspective because they might see something totally different. So I, I learned a lot and I, the army sent me to emotional intelligence classes when I was a civilian and I, that actually was good. I mean, I used to joke about how stupid that training was because like everyone just leaves the class and goes and acts the same way that they used to be acting before. <laughs> but <Yeah>. That's <laughs> true. Was, I know. And I just thought, and it wasn't that the class material was stupid. It was that are people going to really apply it? And that was me being kind of like cynical, but I was in Los Angeles working in public affairs and my boss, another guy I really loved, Aaron Wilkes. And he said, Hey, why don't we go to do this emotional intelligence training? We'll gel as a team. We have an opportunity to take the training. And um, it was actually really good. And our team actually did use it, but I went into it going, Oh Lord, just another day of training that no one's going to listen to but it wasn't it was hands-on interactive and it really did help men and women may have different strengths but when we realize that we're complementary in a lot of really good ways like it makes everything a lot easier yeah and you know in leadership itself you know you pointed out some things um uh, you know it does begin with the individual you know you have to get your own uh, uh, psyche in order, your own mindset when it comes to leadership. And if you're, if you go inward, we've talked about this. If you go and you think about your strengths on the inside first, yeah. then you'll, the, it'll help you on the outside. Um, and somebody that really has clarity and purpose and knows their core values, which you mentioned a couple of times, uh, has a greater opportunity to develop a teamwork mentality with the people they oversee but also, you know, you mentioned the three-star general, you know, he was open and, and you, you picked that up. Remember I said that you were like a sponge, you picked that up and you could see that that openness and being and willingness to listen to those subordinates helped him uh, become more effective. So, and I know that's why, you know, working with KMC Digital is a good thing because you take all of these lessons that you've learned through the school of hard knocks and with a bronze star, I can say that my digital mogul or digital expert has a bronze star and that, and again, they don't just pass those out. So again, and it's not to butter your cup or butter your bread or however that goes, but, <laughs> but those are, those are strengths. And, and I love the fact that you are open enough and honest enough to share those kinds of things with us because the world needs leaders and we're at this place now um, hence the reason we've got this show. We're at a place now where we need to communicate. We need to tell our stories. We need to, and you mentioned this, we need to learn from each other so we can be better. You know, what can, men are struggling. We, you and I've had this conversation. What can women do? What can female leaders do to help guys? What can, what, yeah, what, what needs to happen? I don't know if I'm doing it right. I have a bunch of guys on my team. Um, you could ask them, but I feel like, I do feel that women tend to be so concerned about being heard that it's almost they overcompensate. Like I've learned the art of not saying anything 
and letting really great men like stick up for me versus me trying to push my thing. I'm a woman, you're not listening to me. Why are you talking over me? Why are you mansplaining me? Like you literally as a white dude cannot do anything right, right now. <laughs> like you- And it sucks and it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, gosh. I, mean, I hate to put it that way, but it's how it feels. And I mean, it really men in general, not just white guys, but I joke about that, but it really is men. This person, like one woman, I saw her yell at this boy at the supermarket. Don't you ma'am me, don't you call me ma'am. And I'm like, the kid had a Southern accent. Everyone in the South calls everybody ma'am. I knew that when I lived there, I learned it. It doesn't, like, why are we so offended? Why is everybody so offended? I'm so done. When you are offended about everything, you cannot form good relationships with anyone. You can't, it is, I think it's kind of a protection mechanism for some people like, oh, I'm just gonna stay offended because no one can touch me if I get them first or if I, you know, it It makes us all have to kind of cater to one another in a way that's just unnatural and very stressful. I think we're creating our own stressful environments. If I had said stuff like that to my subordinates, like, hey ma'am, I have this really good idea. Like, why don't we do this? And I'm like, oh, you're a guy, what do you know? You know, that, that'd be so hor- horrible if a guy said that to me as a female, like, well, you're a woman, like, what do you know? You know, go back to the kitchen type of comments, you know? And when you get to know people one-on-one, you might be able to joke a little bit more openly about things. And, but, but I think just giving people, each of us, I think men and women, each of us feel we all need to be loved. We all need to be accepted. We all need to be, feel like we're being understood and considered. Even if the person in charge says, you know, let's shelf that idea right now because we're kind of focused on this, or I don't know if that's the direction we want to go in, whatever the feedback is, but that's just being professional. You're not, you're giving professional feedback on something. And so if we can't even have open discussions with one another about things that are just everyday professional discussions about work you know, why I, we were, what are we going to do with ourselves when things go wrong? Like you I'm going to have, you know, tiptoe around people when my house is on fire. Hey, fireman. I mean, firewoman. I mean, fire person. And my house is on fire. Like, what are we doing to ourselves? Like we, we gotta be a little common sense has to come back. I wish I was born in the thirties. I, I always say that to people. I just Well, it's true though, because you know, what, what I'm, what I'm hearing is be real, you know, Try to reduce the, the alternative universe mentality, which I feel like the world is in today. And, and you're right, Kaylin, it's very astute. You know, everybody seems offended by something and everybody takes things so personal that we can't think straight at times. And so how is that going to, how are we going to move forward if we don't use our common sense and, 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 and our objective reasoning uh, and our leadership styles. I mean, if leaders go, you know, just dogging everybody out all the time or taking everything personal that a subordinate or somebody above them says, we're never going to get anywhere. I, I, I really feel that the world's in this alternative universe right now. And I feel like it's going to be leadership that pulls us out of it. Yeah. And that's a I, whole other story. <laughs> leadership yeah, at the top, right? <laughs> Well, and I think too, people confuse, like, if someone is very, very sensitive about the pronoun that they want to be called, and I'm being serious, I I mean, there are people that are very sensitive to that. And I, I, even at the grocery store, I met someone and um, it's that you can still address that, be polite to that person. If you mess up, okay, say I'm the person that says, listen, I want you to call me this pronoun, whatever it is all the time. And it's really important to me. If someone said that to me, I would do that. But if I mess up, I would hope that the person on the other receiving end would be, give me some grace because it's a new thing that I'm going to have to learn. So like if we give each other grace and we say, okay, or if we joke around about something and it really upsets somebody on the team that we should all be able to say, listen, I know that you were just joking about X, Y, Z, but Like I had a guy during a job interview one time make fun of the fact that I applied for the job because I was pregnant and he knew I was going to have a baby soon. And he goes, he goes, do you think I'm going to hire you? He's like, you're about to have a baby, like so bad. And I looked at him like, kind of like, but there's like, I'm not even 
like I, I in six weeks I'm like back at work like that's the expectation in the army right you get six weeks off you're back at work within six months you're taking your PT test that was the expectation at the time when I had my daughter so I thought okay so maternity leave big whoop like you guys are you don't even have a person in this position now and it's been empty for over a year like what does it matter if you wait six weeks for me to and I have a Blackberry I can text from home it's not that hard so in my mind I couldn't even figure out why that came out of his mouth but that really was how he felt about it but what I did was I said, hey, sir, can we just talk about that interview? I'm like, not only was that like super illegal government interviews, you cannot do that because it's discriminatory. Um, you know, just so you know, if you interview any other females, you know, you should be aware that like they, I could file a complaint, which I didn't do because I had another avenue. But um, in, in that moment, I could have chosen to handle it one of two ways. I could have filed a complaint with the IG. I could have flipped out. I could have told everybody in the office, but I had learned from my Iraq deployment, okay, how do we treat each other like human beings? And that's what you're all about, poetic human. Like how, okay, this person says something really screwed up to me, really not according to regulation either. <laughs> I could wreck his career and, and cause him to be in big fat trouble. Or I could approach him and say, look, I understand what, you said and why you said it and I get your concern and it's a valid concern when someone's about to have a baby although here's my reasons why I don't think that it's a big deal um I'm like I just warn you if there was any other female that you would have said that to you may not have had somebody come and talk to you about it later you might have had just an IG complaint on your hands did you get the and job did you get it no I end up I withdrew because I would have had to work for him <laughs> so oh, I was like yeah. Thank you, you for revealing that. But I, you know, that's when I thank God for revealing his true personality. But I chose to do it in a way where he understood, like for the future, other women aren't going to have to have him say that to them. And so that was my bigger feeling was how can I fix this for the next person in a way that I'm not telling them you stupid idiot, like how the hell would you, why would you say that to somebody? You know, I could have, it could have been bad. These are the little things that no one talks about like these little interactions that can turn into lawsuits, they can turn into retaliation, physical altercations, like all these things from these tiny little moments. So I feel like it's really important before we react to stuff, does this person really care about me and have my best interest at heart? Like I've known that guy for a while. So I knew he really did like me as a person. He just screwed up and said something stupid. So I, and, and I thought, okay, he's look, like, he's trying to get promoted soon too. And he served like 20 something years already in the military. I, he's at the end of his, he's going to be retiring soon. Like, let's just talk to him about it afterwards. And I it's waited. It's probably the better approach. You know, you know, it's interesting in that story. You know, it seems like, and you mentioned it earlier, we all want acceptance. Yeah. We all want approval. But it, it seems like it's almost, and that pandemic might be, I, pervasive is probably the best word, that we have this pervasive, a lot of people out there looking for that in the outside world. We just talked about power over others. We're looking for this acceptance and approval outside of ourselves. And the examples you give show the reasons why it's important to look on the inside first. And if we can accept and approve of ourselves on the inside, it really, even though it will matter, it won't matter as much what people say and do. And maybe we'll be less sensitive because we'll be more cocksure of who we are. You know what I mean? And, and I think that that's important for, we've, we, we hear the word clarity, we hear the word purpose, we hear the word calling. And I almost get a sense that a lot of people out there don't know what it is, especially when you read the stats where 88% of the people interviewed aren't happy with their lives. Mm -hmm. How could you not be happy if you're doing what you want to do? How could you not be happy? I know. And even with this interview, I mean, my, my opinions are not necessarily popular. Like you may post this and I get a bunch of hate mail. I don't know. But I really feel that we need to love on each other a little more. And it does not matter what the issue is, po political uh, any name something controversial like we just how can we talk about it as human beings you and know you said and something already everybody's got an opinion guess what that's our prerogative it's okay to have an opinion it doesn't mean that 
that we like each other less, you know, yeah. but they've turned it into a hate fest. And you mentioned it earlier and you just mentioned it. We have to love on each. And I'm not talking about the love that the world embraces. Right, no. I'm talking about something bigger than that. Yeah. And I've yeah. worked for all with all kinds of different people and for all kinds of different people. And I think it's life is more fun with variety in human beings. I just think that we get mixed up in all this. My feelings get hurt. But what if you took a step back, calmed yourself down and went back to talk to that person and said, hey, what you said was not cool. It really wasn't. And and blah, blah, blah. Versus let's get HR involved immediately. Lawsuit. Blah, blah, blah. Like we could go down that road, too. You know, you know, what's interesting. You talk about feelings right now. Feelings emanate from the left side of the brain. OK. And that's great to have feelings. All human beings do. You could say something mean to me and I, it could hurt my feelings, right? And then I could blow up in your face and do something stupid, say something stupid. But what about, and, and you might love me. So if I did that, it could ruin that love or something, right? But what about the right side of the brain? The right side is the logical side, the reasoning side. If we're going to be balanced human beings in our mindsets, how can we just go about our daily existence going off of our feelings and never using our common sense. And I think that's what we're starting to see now. The chickens are, they're not even chickens now. They're like huge turkeys coming home to roost. Everybody's talking about feelings and nobody's talking about common sense. Mm -hmm. Leaders need to use common sense. You would think. Well, to be fair, we do. I mean, if we want fairness for ourselves, any person walking in the door who needs a job or who, is going to be a vendor for us or who want anybody we work with. We want to, you don't want to work for someone that's going to, you know, mistreat you. And I don't want anyone to feel mistreated by me. Um, and there's every single one of us has qualities that aren't great, I'm sure. And so it's, it's just finding that middle ground where we can give each other grace and be kind of like, you know what, you're having a bad day. What's going on? Cause it could be that they're legitimately just got the worst news of the, in the world and then they walk in and then you say something sideways and then they just lose it. Like you just don't know what's going on with that person. So you're right. How, emotions can also lie. You know, you might be feeling some kind of way. I mean, I, I'm raising an 11 year old, right? She's like 11 going on 17. Oh yeah. So I can imagine. She's got, <laughs> she got her friends. Do you know every, cause I'm friends with all the moms. So there's like a little group of us, four moms and they each have uh, four daughters and it's each their only daughter of the family so um and two of them are only three of them are only children and then the one that has a brother but so it's like the four girls and the four moms we always hang out once a month well let me just tell you every single time i get together with these moms they all say that their daughter feels left out of the group like all the time and my daughter came home yesterday mom i'm just feeling left out today because these two were playing and i wasn't playing and they played a game that I didn't like and I just don't understand like why they just do that and you know when these girls get together this one plays with this one and I don't get included and I'm thinking to myself isn't this so like the core of why there's so many problems and I said Kaya I said you've just got to learn not to be offended I said because what's the truth and she goes what do you mean I'm like well what's the truth do your friends really love you and care about you and do they play with you and spend time with you, invite you to their houses? And I said, you are the most invited kid of any kid that I've ever known. You get invited to sleepovers. I said, when I go on business trips, I, you always have three or four moms that are like, she can stay at my house. Like people love you. I said, so for you to feel that way, what do you, like, how can we, how can you reframe that in your mind and not feel so left out? I said, could you have kind of butted in and said, hey guys, you're leaving me out. What are you guys doing? And would they bring you into the mix? And she goes, well, yeah, probably. And so those feelings, it's like, what are you really, like, what is the core of that? And maybe that's being a kid of a divorced family. You know, maybe she feels left out of things in the family, which I know she does. And cause that's unfortunately a symptom of divorce and not feeling loved on all the time or like her dad's not here. So we do the best we can, but I think as adults, we bring that childhood insecurity into a lot of things, which is also why a lot of times we're like, well, this is my identity, you know, and I want you to make sure you speak to me and address my identity that I have for myself. 
And I can respect that because that's also a part of who we are in the world. We're trying to figure that out. I think it's important that we don't just push those types of things off either. We address that and say, you know what? You're right. Yeah, I messed up. I called you the wrong thing. And I'm only using that gender thing as an example because I actually did that to this poor person at the supermarket. I was talking to some gentleman behind me. He thought I was talking to the cashier, thought I was talking to them. I said the wrong pronoun and he he was so sweet about it. Like he treated me like, he's like, what did you just say? And I'm like, I wasn't talking to you. I said, I'm so sorry if you thought I was like, I didn't, I would never want to disrespect you by calling you a different thing. And he's like, he's like, well, thanks for saying that. He's like, nobody says that to me. And it was just like a moment where I won't forget because I didn't grow up with people talking about multiple genders and it's, Neither did I. you know, and I, I, whatever your belief is on that is fine but like we can love and be graceful and give because then we open the door to conversations about other things that you know like that you're like I don't walk around I don't feel that my gender is my identity and I don't know what that feels like when people say that they feel that I don't understand that because I don't feel that way but that's a great um, point you know I identify as John right I feel like I'm a <laughs> you know it's like uh you can identify me any way you want, but I know who I am. And you know what you're pointing out really is be, be cerebral. You know, yeah. feelings are important and it's important that we watch what we do behavior wise. And, but, but be cerebral, think before you act. You know, how many times have we, my dad used to say that he was an army officer. He was a light bird colonel. And, and he used to get so mad at me because I was always so impetuous and, and I would just, you know, you've seen this, uh, just jump in with, you know, full tilt boogie without thinking. And he would always say, and he gets so mad. He goes, think, think he's gone now. I wish he was around now to see what's going on. But, but you just point that out. And it's, it's important as leaders and as human beings, just to be cerebral. Yeah. You know, do you have a certain mantra that you live by? You have your own quote, or do you have a mantra that you live by when it comes to your daily living um, honestly it's uh isaiah 6 8 is mine it's the send me one that was actually it's basically like if you're called to do something you're gonna go do it and don't question it and don't think about it just if god says go do it you go do it it's kind of like no fear just yeah it, even it, though i am fearful like i even coming into this interview i'm like oh gosh what is john gonna ask me these are normal human emotions, like, you know, thinking if I say something and then he's going to go out there. I do marketing for people. This is even, you want to talk brutally honest. I don't even do videos for myself because I freaking hate it because everyone starts diving in to tell you, what are you wearing? What is your hair looking like? Why did you say that? I don't agree with that. Why is she doing it? And I'm thinking, oh gosh, John's, John's going to ask me something and I'm going to say something and then it's going to be, you know, a bunch of comments. And so I just, I've decided that that's, that's my scripture, John six or Isaiah six, eight is, and I'm just going to go with it. Well, <laughs> so yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's good. I mean, <laughs> anytime we can read a scripture, it's a good thing. And, and yeah, that's, you know, I heard the other day, you know, I choose to be an optimist 99% of the time. <laughs> and the other 1% is my fear telling yeah. me that I'm wrong. That is so true. So you know, and, and so that's, you know, I can tell you this, Kaylin, you know, we've known each other going on four years now. We've, we've been friends, but we've also worked professionally and, and it's been a treat. And, and I'm not kidding. Those who are listening to this interview, you know, sometimes I'm worried about what I'm going to say because I've been read the riot act, but I've been read the riot act out of love. And I know that. And that's why I take a deep breath. I say, okay, Kaylin cares about the mission. Maybe I just need to quit being such a knucklehead. And, and guess what guys, we can make that choice. We don't have to be knuckleheads, knuckle draggers our, our, our whole lives, despite what they want us to believe. We can be cerebral. We don't have to be entirely defensive or aggressive or whatever it is that makes us do the things we don't want to do. Um, how can people find out more, Kaylin, about KMC Digital? You know, where do they need to go? And, and if I'm a client of yours, what are you going to give me? Well... <laughs> uh the website 
<laughs> very quickly, you know, so, but anyway. Website is kmc.digital. There's no .com there or anything after that. It's just kmc.digital. It'll take you to our website. Um, we just, we're a full service agency. So anything from, we have a great team that does pay-per-click ads. They do uh, Facebook, Instagram, Google ads. And we have, uh, you know, amazing graphic designers. I know John's worked with all of our team. We have content creators. We have web developers. We have, I mean, whatever you need, uh, we would do a custom plan. We do have some packages, but for the most part, people tend to, to need something custom depending on what they're doing. But well, it's, and Kaylin's right. It truly is custom. You know, not every client is the same. And that's one thing that's been a real joy is that I haven't been a cookie cutter client and, and I feel it. And I have worked with agencies or people say they can do things and they can't. Everything that Kaylin's team and her and her have told me they're going to do, they've done. And so thank you for that, because in this day and age, in the digital world, uh, there's a lot of things that aren't real out there. So, you know, Kaylin, thanks for being on this episode of Well. And and for those of you who really want something that's not cookie cutter when it comes to branding and digital marketing and advertising and things like that and, and putting together brand books and things, visit kmc.digital because I can assure you it's going to be a, a one of the best calls or one of the best emails you ever made. Thank you, Kaylin. Thank you for listening to another episode of Well. Without you, we don't exist. We hope the men who joined us today learned some valuable tips to improve and not be ashamed to use them. Be the change, set the example, keep going, men. And for the women leaders out there, keep creating and keep helping us men to become even better men, more effective leaders. Thank you. Until next time, stay safe, be well, and lead.